Hey, thank you so much for joining us today at Zootown Church Online. Uh, today we are actually hosting our services from Scandia House Loft in Hamilton, Montana, um, with the beautiful Bitterroot Mountains behind us. And for a couple of reasons, and is one is we just wanted to show some support to our Bitterroot community. Uh, you guys have just been so awesome over the years, not only just driving up and being with us, but some of our best uh, people of, of, who are serving at our church and, and giving of their finances. And, and again, we are still pushing forward with the Hamilton campus. Uh, we've just hit some bumps in the road. And then obviously the coronavirus thing is throwing some whole new challenges in. But we just want to let you know how much we appreciate you and, and, and love this Bitterroot community. And again, big shout out to the owner of the Scandia House Loft uh, for letting us do this today. So if you're in Hamilton, check it out. Uh, get some good wine and cheese here. And the second reason I wanted to do it up here is just because uh, during this coronavirus pandemic, one thing we've realized is how special it is to, to be together. And um, obviously bars or coffee houses or restaurants, whatever, that was taken from us for months. And you realize how special it is. And, and we have taken it for granted because we just get to use it so often um, that it's something that we missed. And now that things are kind of opening back up, it's something that we actually are going to appreciate again. But one of the reasons that we get together at places like this is for the camaraderie, for the, the fellowship. And, and one thing that we always do and love during that fellowship is to tell stories. We love telling stories of our life. We love telling stories from the past. We, we love just talking about things that, that really spark our attention and, and, and something that we remember the rest of our life. And, and that's why we get together and that's why we, we love the story because God put us in that because God loves a story. If, if you think about it from God's perspective, he's seen every human who's ever lived on the planet, every situation, good, bad, indifferent, whatever. He's seen it and it's, it all ties in and it's all interwoven to this thing we call the human story. And so uh, yeah, again, we see God who he, he invests in the human story. He walks in the progress of the human story. Every war, uh, every marriage, every birth, everything all gets tied up into this grand redemption story. And the reason we love stories and that's in us is because stories engage us. Stories uh, spur a, a certain emotion. They allow us to enter into something in the human soul. Even things that aren't happening to us, um, we, can, we can still engage in them. We can still feel them. We can still cry during movies or, or reading a book, whatever it is, that stories truly engage our soul into something bigger um, and, and more mysterious than, than we're actually living right now. And we all have a story that we've been engaged in. And so one thing I see in the scriptures and especially the gospels is that Jesus loved to use stories because he knows that's how uh, we connect with him and how we connect with each other and just how we connect overall with life. And when we see in the Bible what they call those stories as is they call them parables. What's interesting about the parables is, is I've heard two reactions to them, and, and this is 2,000 years later even, and back then they couldn't understand why he was speaking in parables, and 2,000 years later I still hear people saying, why did he speak in parables? It's interesting that some people, if you're more literal, you take these parables uh, you know, extra literal, and, and, and when I, I believe when we do that, we miss really what was going on there, that there was a reason that Jesus was telling these stories or these deep truths uh, in story form is because he wanted us to, to connect with them in a different way, because that's why we connect with movies uh, and, and you know, athletics, whatever it is. It's all just this story, and he knows that's how the human soul connects. So I've heard a lot of people even just say, why didn't he just say it so plainly? Why wouldn't he just tell us? Why did he use stories? And so that's what we're going to kind of unpack and um, try to discover these next few months. And, and again, I don't know how long this is going to go, but we're going to just check out Jesus's parables. But here's one thing we need to know about the parables and why Jesus spoke with them. And it's because Jesus let us know that everything is spiritual. Every single story, every single thing we're going through, every single emotion that we have a spirit and we have flesh, but everything is involved in the spiritual realm. He even said that God is spirit. The Father is spirit. And now we have the Holy Spirit. And so this is a spiritual thing that we are created in. We are created in the image of God, the Holy Trinity, and it is spiritual. So Jesus is using these stories to try to get us to understand the spiritual side of life because that is the actual thing that's happening around us. Even C.S. Lewis said that you are not a body with a spirit, but you are a spirit with a body. 
And so sometimes we flip those things, but all you need to do is go to a funeral with an, an open casket and you'll see that person and you kind of recognize them, but they're not there. There's something missing and that is life because that's what life is, is it's in the spirit. And so these stories in the scriptures, these stories in the whole Bible, uh, don't just have a literal meaning. There's this spiritual meaning behind everything. And that is where we grow. That's where we understand. And that's where it really affects us deep down in our souls. I don't know if you guys have been watching uh, the documentary, The Last Dance on ESPN, but it's, it's been wonderful. It's, it's all about, you know, Michael Jordan and the Bulls, like six championships and basically their last year. And, and uh, it kind of goes back in time to, to events that lead up to that. And it's been such a joyous thing for me because one, it helps me feel like a little kid. And even the first week, I just told my whole family, like nobody can talk for two hours. And it was such a, a, a reminder of my childhood. But what's fun is watching my kids connect with it, that they are like, holy cow, this guy was amazing. And this team was amazing. And so it's like, I get to relive that story all over again, even though it was 20 years ago. But it's fascinating as you watch that documentary, it, you just kind of look at Jordan as in, in all the players, you just see him in the, the physical realm where, um, you know, he was so smooth, his jumper looked so good, he could jump so high, and, and you just admire, and we almost forgot how good that guy was. But there's this scene then where it starts talking about his father and his relationship with his dad. And that's where you can start engaging in the spiritual realm of things. His father, if you don't know, was actually murdered in 1993. And uh, this, this had a deep impact on his life. And even though he's kind of got this stoic face throughout the whole time he's explaining it, there's this one scene where it shows Michael Jordan win another championship after his father died on Father's Day. And you just see Jordan, this tough exterior, this guy who's brash, he's, he's arrogant. You see him just melt like a little child. And you see him on the floor holding a basketball and just weeping, like weeping and weeping and weeping. And even my daughter was like, man, he's, that, that's intense. And what that is, is you're seeing the spiritual side. You're seeing his spirit come out because that's what life really is. And that's what the human story is. And that's what the parables are all about. Even the Old Testament, when you look at it, I firmly believe it's, it's, the, it's still my favorite part of the Bible because it's the greatest story ever told because it's the human story. The Old Testament is showing us who humans are and how God is engaging uh, the human story within all these different elements. And, and the reason I love it is it's just so filled with drama, things that we can recognize. There's sex, there's betrayal, there's violence, there's lamenting, there's every single emotion you can think of, you find it in the Old Testament. Yet it's still one of the hardest books to read because there's so many different things things going on and there's so much, there's poetry, there's allegory, there's all types of different ways of writing in the Old Testament. So when we read that, sometimes we miss with the literal that we miss the spiritual connotation behind it. And that's the way that, that G, that's why Jesus came and spoke in parables is because he was trying to get us to read all of the scriptures through this spiritual lens. The early church actually believed that you, you read the Bible in three different ways. You read it with uh, first the literal and then the moral, but finally you get to the spiritual. And the spiritual is where the real depth takes place. Basically, we need to break through our flesh. We need to break through our culture. We need to break through our upbringing and allow his word to really cut way down deep into our spirits. And that's how we get the overall meaning of things. I love what Origen said he, in, in reading the scriptures, specifically the Old Testament. He said, we need to go beyond the ordinary usage that speech would indicate to find the meaning of the spirit, which lies profoundly buried underneath. See, again, I was just thinking in, in terms of, of even farming, right? Like you, you don't put a seed on top of the ground or else it won't sprout, it won't grow. A seed needs to go underground, it needs to be buried. It needs to be unseen for a season because that's where the roots grow deep. That's where it gets its nourishment and its nutrients. And then it starts poking out through the ground and you start seeing the growth of that. And that is what following Jesus is all about. That is why we need to see the spiritual side of the scriptures to really understand them. And I was even thinking about David and Goliath, right? Like uh, you know, when, whenever we, a preacher preaches that story, he always or she always finds a spiritual connotation behind it. Like it's not just about David chopping this big giant's head off. I mean, my son thinks that's the coolest part, but they always then say, give a sermon on what are the giants in your life that need, that need to come down, right? So even then with the Old Testament, we start seeing the spiritual side of things. And so understanding the parables and understanding the, the reason that Jesus talked in story should go throughout all the scripture. And that is where the real growth starts to happen. 
I even just think about movies, right? You guys know I'm a movie guy, I'm a documentary guy, specifically as I get older and more documentaries because that is the human story. But I love film and, and if you just think like, what are the movies that stick with us? What are the movies that change us? What are the movies that enlighten us? It's the ones that have this deeper meaning that has to unfold. Like when you, when you, know, when you watch a comedy, you just kind of laugh, but it's, there's never like really anything a comedy does to your soul per se. There needs to be some drama, there needs to be some uh, some depth that, that is unfolding, this mystery that's kind of going on, and those are the ones you tell your friends to watch. Those are the ones that you watch again. I was thinking like The Sixth Sense. If, you, if you've ever seen The Sixth Sense, the first time you watched it, you know, you just see that this little kid has this ability to talk to dead people, and uh, he, he has a therapist who's helping him talk to dead people, and, and he's trying to, you know, release these dead people from this certain bondage that they have. And you go this whole movie thinking that that's what the movie was all about. And then you get to the end, and you see that the therapist, Bruce Willis, he was actually a ghost himself, and the whole point of the story was uh, this little kid helping him find freedom from his bondage. And the crazy part about that then and why that mystery and why that unfolding is so important is because then the second time you watch it, you know what's going on and you start catching things that you never saw before. And that's why it's important to understand the spiritual side of these parables and of the scriptures. Again, if, if you think about even the Star Wars saga, it was a brilliant move because you almost had to watch two full Star Wars before you understood what was actually going on. And then there's that iconic moment where uh, you think the whole time that Darth Vader killed Luke Skywalker's father, but it was actually poetry. It was allegory that yes, he did kill him, meaning that dark side killed him, but he was still alive in that iconic scene where he says, we will rule the galaxy as father and son. Me and Easton say that together all the time. But notice how that made that movie so much better. That made that movie so much more interesting. And you, then you rewatched it and you got a lot of the things that were going on that you never saw before. So here's the point of this. Here's why it's important to understand these parables is because Jesus has not only written, directed, and produced the greatest story ever told, the human story, he also starred in it. He lived the human story. He suffered under the human story. He was betrayed in the human story. Jesus, it says, was tempted in every single way that humans are. And in the greatest plot twist, mystery, like game-changing moment of any story, Jesus died and rose from, the, uh, rose from the grave to redeem the human story. This is why it's important to understand these things that are going on. So in order to understand and really enjoy a story, you can't just look at the surface level. You have to see the thing behind the thing. And that's the spiritual world. That's the spiritual connotations of these stories. And so that's what we're gonna look at. And that's what I've called this series is the thing behind the thing. That we're not just gonna read these parables. We're not gonna read these stories. And even some of these stories that we think aren't parables are actually spiritual parables that Jesus was leading people to. And we're gonna walk through these for a season so we can grow, we can be more enlightened as we look at the greatest story ever told. So Jesus had three categories of communicating his parables. It was kingdom, grace, and judgment. And so we're gonna take some time in this season to walk through each one of those categories. Um, and again, I, I might take a little break in between and do something else, but, but we're gonna take an in-depth look at what those stories were all about. But they all come down to kingdom, grace, and judgment. And so first we're gonna start with kingdom. And the reason why is if you've heard uh, me talking the last few years, I have, I've had a shift in, in what real Christianity is all about and what real preaching is all about, and that is, um, crucial to understanding what the whole mission of Christianity is, and that is the kingdom of God. It was the main thing that Jesus spoke about and talked about. N.T. Wright, who is probably the world leader in understanding and communicating the kingdom of God, um, theologian from, uh, from England, says this. He says, the point of the resurrection is that the present bodily life is not valueless just because it will die. What you do with your body in the present matters because God has a great future in store for it. What you do in the present by painting, preaching, singing, sewing, praying, teaching, building hospitals, digging wells, campaigning for justice, writing poems, caring for the needy, loving your neighbor as yourself will last into God's future. 
These activities are not simply ways of making the present life a little less beastly, a little more bearable until the day when we leave it behind altogether, as the hymn so mistakenly puts it. They are part of what we call building for God's kingdom. Again, I, I'm an evangelist. That's, that's, that's what I love to do. It, it's in my heart. It's to bring people to the faith. It's to bring people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That, that's still my heart. It's how God made me, and I love it. But as I've grown and as I have matured, I also just see that, uh, again, evangelism is needed, but it, it's also kind of alluring to our American culture because you can gauge evangelism. It, it's more sexy than the kingdom of God. It's more sexy than talking about some of these hard things um, in the parables because you can gauge it. You can say this many people gave their life to Jesus, this many people got baptized, and again, as Americans, we love to gauge success. And so I, I, I love evangelism, and I know us Americans love evangelism, but understanding these parables and getting the kingdom of God as our main focus, again, it's, it's not as glamorous. It takes time. It takes, it takes energy. It takes seeking and growing and understanding and chewing and desperation and all those human emotions because you can't fit the kingdom of God in some systematic theological box. I know we want to do that so we can just say, see, we got it down. But these parables are so filled with mystery and nuance and all types of things that it takes time and it takes growth uh, and maturity to get some of these. And so even though I am an evangelist, I do believe that the kingdom of God was the main thing that Jesus came to show us. If, if I can put it this way, just the human story in general. Again, if I could break down the whole human story from Genesis to now, Basically, after we sinned, after we, we chose to disobey God and it confused our minds of who God is and who we are and all kinds of stuff, you saw the human story just going down a deep progression. It was just going down and down and down and down and until it hit its lowest point. And the lowest point of the human story is when we crucified God. Jesus was God. So we had to get to this lowest point that we're so blinded, we're so delusional, we're so messed up, we actually killed God thinking we were honoring God. That's how messed up we are. So we got to this lowest point, and then Jesus preaches the kingdom of God, which means when he was resurrected uh, for humanity's sake, now he has been slowly bringing humanity back. And he is taking us somewhere in this coronavirus. He is taking, he's always taking humanity somewhere. If you think about some of the things that we believed and practiced just 60 years ago, like segregation, he has brought the human story forward. And he's going to continue to do that. But that's what the kingdom of God is. And that's why these, these parables are, are, are important, like crucial to understand. Because Jesus came to redeem this planet not just to get us out of here. And I know some of us have so much pain. We've had so much drama. We've had so much heartache in this life. Like we just want to get out of here. But that isn't the point of the New Testament. We got to work through this pain. We got to work through these stories of betrayal. We got to work through this sin so we don't miss what Jesus actually has called us to do as he's bringing the kingdom of God closer and closer to its fullness. Uh, even one of the first things that Jesus said with John the Baptist in Matthew 4, he says this, John the Baptist is announcing all this, uh, you know, repentance and all these things. And then he baptizes Jesus and he kind of gets out of the way because now it's time for Jesus' ministry. And listen to what it says in Matthew 4. It says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the very first thing he started to preach wasn't just repent. Don't just repent and get your get out of hell free card. It was repent because there's something bigger and better and more mysterious and deeper at hand right here, right now. So the very first parable that he talks about is actually a farming parable. And you got to understand when, you, when you're reading the parables, and I'm going to keep working through this, is that oftentimes we try to bring them into our Western culture and our Western mindset. He was speaking to Jews. He was talking to them with their culture, their mindset, their religion, their history, their background. And so that's how we need to get into this story. And so when he starts with a farming story, uh, farming was way different back then. But what, one thing about coronavirus we're learning is that for the first time in most of our lives, we didn't just get to go to the store and buy something that we wanted. We were out of things. We, 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 we now recognize how important, you know, gardening and farming and all those things are. So even right there, we can connect with this story um, that, that he's trying to relay to us. But the main thing I want you to see is when, as we're talking about these parables is you need to engage in how the Jews were thinking. Because the Jews already had a mindset of who the Messiah would be and what he would do. They thought the story had already been written. 
And this is why they often missed his parables. And this is why we often miss our, his parables is because we go into it with a preset view of exactly how we think it's going to go down. See, they thought the Messiah was going to come with sword in hand and he was going to wipe all their enemies out. And then the, the redemption of the world would come when Israel is back at number one spot. And so that's how they were thinking. And he knew that. He knew that he was engaging them on that level. And it's important for us to see that because, like I said, we often miss some of these parables and the deeper meanings because we're bringing our preconceived notions and we're bringing our culture. And again, it's not our fault. This is how we're raised. But we need to kind of break through some of this. And so this uh, parable is actually in three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, but we're going to look at the Luke one today. And it says in Luke 8, When a large crowd was coming together, and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of parable. And he says this, The sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture." Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. As he said these things, he would call out, He who has ears, let him hear. Now again, I'm guessing that most people in the crowd had ears. I'm guessing that most people in the crowd, I know there were some deaf people that he, he healed, but everyone could hear. So what's he talking about? Like right when he says this, are they like, well, I have ears, so I understand this. Of course, he's talking about the spiritual side of things. He's talking about there's, there's a message behind the message. There's a thing behind the thing. And so one of the main things that hooks you into a good book or a good story or a good movie, whatever it is, is how when, when something dramatic happens at the beginning, um, to, to kind of hook you. But what's interesting about this parable is it seems pretty straightforward. Again, this was in Mark, and Mark's kind of the most linear gospel, like saying this happened, this happened, this happened. So this is really his first parable, and it seems really straightforward, and I, I think it is in some ways. And I want to show you throughout the next couple of weeks that there's way more spiritual depth than you can imagine with this parable. But he starts out slow. And again, what he's doing is, is he's building a story. He's connecting all the parables together. And so we can't just pull this one out even and make a whole theology around it. We got to connect it all. But he's really talking to little children in a way. It's like he's sitting down his, his, his little disciples and these people, and he's going to tell them, a, a, you know, a bedtime story. And it does seem pretty straightforward, but I even do this with my kids, right? Like there's certain stories in the Old Testament that I leave some of the more gruesome parts out right now, and I just kind of share the spiritual side because they're not ready for it. And so I know that this parable seems really straightforward, but it's really not. Jesus is kind of warming his audience up. He's, he, he's giving them like, you know, in a movie, how there's a trailer to the movie. He's, he's giving them a trailer to how the rest of his, his parables are going to go. And I'm going to talk more about that next week. But it does seem like this one is pretty straightforward. And, and this parable is actually super unique because it's one of the only parables that Jesus goes on to explain himself. The interesting thing about this, again, though, is... is even in his explanation that we're going to look at is, is he's just, he's, he's talking to people in a general way to start this off. But as it builds and it builds and it builds, and the more mature you get, the more you will see even in this parable. So this isn't a simple parable. I know it seems like it is, but it's actually not. How I like to view it is, again, with movies is, is like, you know, I love the vacation movies with Chevy Chase. And, and I remember watching them as a kid or watching them as a teenager. And the older you get, the funnier those movies actually get. Summer Vacation was funny, but you saw it from the kid's perspective. And now, as I've grown older and I see these, these crazy, you know, adventures that Clark Griswold and these mistakes that he made, that gets funnier and funnier because now I can understand it from the parent perspective. And that movie has taken on a whole new light. Because all you have to do is go on one long road trip with your kids or your family, and you can start laughing at some of those scenes. And so that's what Jesus is doing with this parable, is, is you, you can take this literal, you can see the, the simple side of this parable, which he's going to describe, but this parable has major, major depth to it. And the more you read it, the more you pray, the more you get into it, the more you will be enlightened from it, and the more you will see that spiritual side. Verse 11, he says this, as he explains the parable to his disciples. It says, the seed is the word of God. 
Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while and in a time of temptation fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. And as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, hold fast, hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. Again, it's so easy to say, well, yeah, it's very simple. Jesus just laid it all out for us. But I say no. Yes, he's talking to them in in their moment and their understanding, and he's laying it all out. But um, the reason I chose Luke's account is because there's some key verses before he lays this parable out to them that's trying to hook them into the story. Like I said, uh, a great story has ins and outs, nuances, and it kind of hooks you into it so you keep following the progression. Notice, though, he does tell us some ways how not to grow. It is to be consumed totally by the world or tempted in some way that just distracts us. But from what? the kingdom of God. So again, I believe that so many people, like they, they do love Jesus, but there's so many different desires and so many different things that, that get in the way and they're not willing to go deeper into this parable. If you just read this and, or you just go to church and have the pastor say this, if you don't actually get into these parables, I think that's one way he's warning us that we will kind of miss uh, some of the deeper fruit that's gonna take fruition if we go deeper and deeper into this story. Again, I've said this before, and I just want to say it again, that we're not reading these parables just to have a literal reading to say that we understand them. Jesus is not just about information. Jesus is about revelation. And so there's a thing behind the thing in this parable. And look at verse 9. Listen to what he says to them before he explains the parable. It says his disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said, to you, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. See right here, even though he lays this out in a literal way, he sets it up by saying the parables are filled with mystery. It's not just this literal meaning. It's not just checking off a box of information. This is something that continues to grow. These stories are something that are relevant 100 years ago, 500 years from now. These stories are filled with mystery. And so the point of following Jesus and the point of really digging into the word is so you can get the mystery of things. But we don't like that when it comes to real life, but we love it with movies. Why do we love mysterious movies? Why do we love movies with, with different ins and outs and, and different characters? And, and you might think he's the bad guy or he's, he's the one deceiving people. We love that. But why don't we love it when it comes to the scriptures? We should. Jesus just said, this is the main thing behind it, is getting the mystery of these things. I think about the movie Seven, right? Uh, With Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman. My wife loves the movie Seven because Morgan Freeman is so good looking in that movie. Uh, Just kidding, it was Brad Pitt. But... That movie is this crazy movie where, you know, this guy is kind of a serial killer, but he's walking through the different seven deadly sins. And you're just waiting for them to catch him. Uh, And at the end of the movie, you see that the, the turn, the flip, is that the last deadly sin is wrath. And Brad Pitt actually commits that last deadly sin. That's what the whole movie was actually all about. But you missed it if you were just seeing, again, like the the surface level of things, there was actually this deeper meaning going on. That's the mystery. That's why we love mysterious movies and mysterious books. And that's why we should love these parables. And Jesus told us that. He said, this isn't just the literal meaning of these things. There uh, There is fruit, there is growth, there is tension behind every one of these parables. Even this, this parable that seems so simple to understand, it's not. Again, in Luke 8, I think this is a very important passage because he goes on to say this. Right after he gives them the explanation, he stops them and says, no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it over with a container and puts it under a bed. He puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. Again, there's so much depth in this parable. There's, even though he just explained it to us, I'm telling you there are so many hidden things behind the things. 
and I'm not going to tell them to you today because I want you to go read. I want you to take this week to read these parables in Matthew, Mark, and Luke and know that the key thing that Jesus is saying here, the key to growth, the key to understanding, the key to freedom is being open. Jesus flat out said right there, those who are open will be given more. Those who are not open, what they have, what they think they have will be taken from them. It is so important in being open when following Jesus. It's so important to, to what Jesus is saying is that to really get understanding, to really understand the deep things. You can't read this stuff on just, and you can't just stop at the literal meeting. This takes time. This takes growth. This takes putting your culture, your preconceived notions, all types of things behind you and saying, Jesus, I need you to show me. I need you to teach me. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It's, it's our teacher. And so I'm not going to tell you what I think this means. But Jesus promises that if you do this, if you persevere, more will be added to you. You will see more things behind the things. And when you start seeing the spiritual side of things, when you can break through the surface level meeting, and when you're not satisfied with the surface level meeting, that is where real growth happens. That is where real, because the seed, he always talks about seeds in the parables. The seed is planted. You don't see it. So one of those things is God is always working when you don't even see it. But he's saying, we need to water this. We need to nurture this. We need to absorb this. And we need to seek this to get the deeper meaning of these parables. And this is when it helps our soul grow. This is what brings freedom. But he also gives a warning here that he says, if you are not open to more teaching, if you think you got this all figured out and you just take the literal meaning of this and you just said, well, I got this down and I got this in this nice systematic theology box. He says, what you even think you have will be taken from you. This is the key to growth and maturity. This is the key to understanding the mysteries of the kingdom. Because if you don't, and he's really talking to the Pharisees and anyone who's not willing to go deeper in some of this stuff, he says, what it will replace with is fear, anger, judgment, and a Pharisee spirit. And you will miss the deeper meaning of what he's trying to get, the growth of the fruits of the spirit. So I'm not going to tell you what's going on here today. I want you to go this week and I want you to read this and I want you to pray and I want you to chew and don't read commentaries. Don't read them. I want you to seek Jesus. I want you to cultivate it because again, I'm trying to break our church from some things or just the church that it's not about a pastor just coming out and telling you what I think. It's not about a pastor just coming out and saying, well, this is what you have to believe because I'm learning, I'm growing with Jesus too. And I believe Jesus speaks to you. I want us to have a relationship with Jesus. One thing we're learning in coronavirus is that, again, we don't have a church right now. You are the church. So you're speaking good wisdom. You're speaking good things to people or you're freaking people out or you're casting judgment. That's not what this is about. This is about fruit. And so next week, we're gonna go deeper and deeper and deeper into this. But again, the key is, are you open? Are you open? Are you, are you longing for the deeper meaning? Are you longing for more than just this? Okay, I read it and it's done. Are you, are you wanting the spiritual side of these parables to really take shape and to grow in your soul, in your heart, in your mind? That's the question I want to ask you before we get deep into these parables is, are you open? Because Jesus promises if you're open, more will be given to you. I want to end with just a story because we love stories and I love stories. And I recently was re-watching the uh, the baseball documentary from Ken Burns, just called Baseball. It's this 10-part documentary. It's just awesome. And I've been missing baseball. And so I just decided to watch it again. I've watched it probably three times now, but it just goes through the history of baseball and how much baseball meant to our country. Uh, I mean, it was amazing seeing these world-famous athletes, baseball players, uh, being in World War II for four years. I mean, just a, just a last of a generation, just an incredible generation. And, and it's just so fun watching how baseball progressed and grew. I mean, the fans used to be on the field. The fans used to be wandering around. And, and when they would hit, hit it in the outfield, the fans used to move around so the outfielder couldn't find the ball. I mean, just to watch how baseball progressed has been awesome. But there was one particular story about a guy named Branch Rickey. And Branch Rickey um, was the owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And Branch Rickey tells a story where years before Jackie Robinson ever played for the Brooklyn Dodgers, because obviously there was segregation and, and, and African-Americans were not allowed to play baseball. They had their own league called the Negro Leagues. And they said some of the greatest baseball players you've never heard of were in the Negro Leagues. 
but Branch Rickey had a, uh, you know, a young black man who was traveling with him and his baseball team, but he couldn't play. And he also couldn't stay in the same hotel as them. And Branch Rickey said he, he tried to check them into a hotel and, and the guy behind the counter says, you know, we don't allow black people to stay here. And Branch Rickey said, well, what if he stays in my room? You know, and this is the owner of the Brooklyn Dodger. He said, what if he stays in my room? And so reluctantly, the, the guy behind the counter says, okay, sure. And he says, as he's checking, he, he, he sent the young man up to his room and he got the rest of the team checked in. And he said that when he walked up to the room, he could hear that young black man weeping. And he walked in and he sees this kid rubbing his hands. And he said, it's my skin, it's my skin. And as he was weeping and crying, Branch Rickey said that the rest of his life, he heard that boy's screams and his weeping and his wailing in his dreams. And he decided I was gonna do something about it. And years later, he had the first African-American player to play in the major leagues under great scrutiny named Jackie Robinson. Because Branch Rickey was open, because Branch Rickey was willing to put some of the cultural things beside, because Branch Rickey was willing to put some of his, uh, you know, his reputation aside, he changed not only baseball, he changed our country, and he changed generations of African-Americans that came after it because he was open because he was willing to be open to a, a deeper truth. And that is my prayer for these parables, that we're open so we can see the deeper spiritual truth of the story of God and the human story, and not only where we've been, but where we're going. So go read those parables this week, and then come listen to next week's, and we'll see what the Spirit kind of laid out for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.